Will the Gonzaga Bulldogs and Kentucky Wildcats meet for the first of six highly con- anticipated non-conference matchups? The loser will take their second loss on the young season. More on that right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode is brought to you by Underdog. Sign up on Underdog Fantasy with the promo code Locked On, and you will get your first deposit doubled of up to $100. All right, Zags Cats today, Mark Few versus John Calipari, Oscar Shibwe. Drew Timmy, Hunter Salas, Severe Wheeler, plenty of exciting, intriguing potential matchups coming up on Sunday, 4.30 p.m. at the Spokane Arena. We have talked at length on this podcast about the desire to see this game at the kennel. There's been split decisions. More people get to go to the game at the arena, more people in the Spokane community who otherwise would not get the opportunity to see the Zags. That is objectively a good thing. I talked even on on Thursday's podcast after Gonzaga's loss to Texas, talked about the desire for more true road games. I don't really care if Kentucky plays true road games. They don't don't matter that much to me. I care that Gonzaga does. I think it's good for them to experience those kind of environments. Uh, It was unfortunate what happened against Texas for, oh, so many reasons, and we don't need to spend too much more time on that game because nobody wants to be spending more time talking about that game in particular. But I do think that... This is a a missed opportunity, of course, for Gonzaga to get a chance to play a really marquee game at their home stadium. They will get to play it years and years from now, as this is a six-game series with the final game of the series being the one that was agreed to be in uh, at the kennel, excuse me, I was going to say in Spokane, but this one is in Spokane. That one is actually going to be at the kennel back in 2027 after the Zags will have played a true road game at Rupp Arena twice. But hey, I'm an advocate for Gonzaga playing more true road games. I'm happy they're going to Rupp. I'm happy that they played at the new Moody Center in Texas, even though it didn't go well. I think that more games like this is going to be a good thing. Gonzaga and Kentucky have only played once way back in 2002. The Zags were a very good team back then. I think they, were, they and Kentucky were ranked within five points of each other, or five spots of each other in the rankings. So this was a really good, Kentucky, or really good Gonzaga team, of course, a really good Kentucky team. But Gonzaga wasn't at the at the level that they are now. They had not ascended to this level where they're kind of right in that conversation for number one seeds uh, every single year, number one overall ranking in the AP poll. Now they're in that conversation. Now these two teams come together, but both teams already have a loss. That is an interesting dynamic of this game. One of either Gonzaga or Kentucky on Monday when the AP poll will come out, one of those teams is going to have two losses, and that is not something that I think was extremely expected. We knew Gonzaga might be have a struggle with Michigan state. We knew Gonzaga might struggle on the road against Texas. So it's possible that they lose one of those games. Of course, we didn't know the, the, how dramatically they would lose that game against Texas for Kentucky. The only real game that looked like a potential slip up on their calendar was against Michigan state in the champions classic. Their other three games, Howard Duquesne and South Carolina state took care of those three teams quite handily as you would expect the John Calipari squad to do. But They did not take care of Michigan State. Boy, did they try that game. If you guys missed this one, highly recommend checking it out or at least watching some highlights of it. First game of the Champions Classic, Kentucky-Michigan State, followed up by Duke-Kansas. Kentucky-Michigan State, of course, because it's the first part of the series, goes into double overtime, a really, really dramatic, intense back-and-forth battle between these two teams, eventually Michigan State was able to pull it out in part because Oscar Shibwe, who came off the bench to drop 22 points with 18 rebounds and four blocks off the 
bench. He didn't start because they were trying to limit his minutes because of his recent knee injury. He ended up playing 34 minutes because it's hard to limit a guy's minutes when he's the most important player on your team and you're in danger of losing to, at the time, an unranked Michigan State team. That will change. Michigan State is probably a top 20, borderline top 15 team in the country, which helps Gonzaga in the sense that they got that victory there. For the Wildcats, it puts a little bit more urgency on them to win this game. Of course, they have a, a nice SEC schedule coming up. They're going to be fine. Uh, they're a young team in some ways similar to Gonzaga. Gonzaga is not that young in a lot of places, but they have two sophomores playing really significant roles. Kentucky is much more freshman focused, as they tend to often be. Severe Wheeler is one of their freshman guards, and he's one of the best young players in the entire country. He is phenomenal, and he is unfortunately – the exact kind of player that gives Gonzaga challenges. Uh, he fits the bill to a T. He's big, he's long, he's physical, he's athletic. He's got really, really good nose for the basketball. His defensive instincts are off the charts good. He's also a, a seamless offensive player who can get to the rim with ease. Those are all things that kind of poke at Gonzaga's biggest weaknesses. His ability to be physical with Gonzaga's guards as soon as they cross half court is going to cause problems. This guy had, he had five steals at halftime in the Michigan State game. He ended up with eight in that game. He played 44 minutes because the game went into double overtime. 44 minutes for Severe Wheeler. He is a really good player and somebody to watch closely for this team. Um, sorry, he's not, he's not, I'm sorry, I was talking about him as a freshman. He's not a freshman, he's a veteran guy. Cason Wallace is the freshman on this team who's going to cause all sorts of problems for Gonzaga just because of his physicality, because of his ability to get those steals out in transition. Severe Wheeler is a very, very good passing guard. Uh, I think he had eight, eight assists off the bench in that game, and more of a veteran guy for Kentucky. So Severe Wheeler, veteran guy, going to cause some problems for Gonzaga because of his ability to attack the rim. Cason uh, Wallace, freshman going to cause all sorts of problems for Gonzaga on the defensive end of the floor. Of course, the big matchup in this one is the big fellas down low, Oscar Shibwe, Drew Timmy. They faced off once before, back when Shibwe was at West Virginia a couple of years ago during the Jalen Suggs season. Shibwe looked good in that game. Drew Timmy looked good in that game. The Zags ended up winning. Shibwe is a very different player now. He came to Kentucky. He's been a rebounding machine. He's one of the best rebounders I've ever seen. Just period. He, he's a phenomenal nose for the basketball. Really good at getting position, grabbing the ball off the rim. He's going to cause some problems for Gonzaga, especially on the offensive glass if they don't put a body on him. He's developing more into a shot blocker. He's developing more into a player who can actually impact the game defensively. That's not great news for the Zags either because Drew Timmy is how they're going to get their offense. He's going to be what they're kind of working to and funneling through on the offensive end of the, of the floor. If Oscar Shibwe can be more of a defensive presence for the Wildcats and, and shut down Drew Timmy in, even in one-on-one -on -one situations, not a lot of players can do that. And I'm not saying Shibwe is, is necessarily a lock to do that. Uh, but if he's more capable of doing that than many of the other bigs that Gonzaga is going to face this year, that does make Kentucky's job on the defensive end a little bit easier. Uh, finally, we talked Severe Wheeler. We talked about Kaysen Wallace, the freshman guard. Uh, Jacob Toppin is another big piece for Kentucky. Obi Toppin's younger brother. For those of you who remember Obi Toppin, the dunking machine at Dayton, who's now with the New York Knicks. Uh, Jacob Toppin is a also very long, athletic, six foot nine forward, can do a little bit of everything. He's a really strange matchup for the Zags. I think Julian Strother is probably going to draw that assignment. I think he'll be able to hold his own a little bit, but Toppin is a player that if Shibwe's having a rough night or if Wheeler or Kaysen Wallace aren't doing much on the offensive end, Toppin's the kind of guy who could go for 25 and kill you in a way that you might not have game planned against him necessarily to do so. All right, second segment coming up. We talked a lot here in the first part about what makes Kentucky so good. We want to talk in the second segment about how Gonzaga can win this one, what they can do to avoid taking another loss and send John Calipari home with two L's on the season. Before we get there, though, I want to tell you all about underdog fantasy. This episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to spice up college basketball season. It's crazy easy to sign up and get started, and each game can be a different bet or pick em choice for your favorite Gonzaga stars. Do you think Drew Timmy is going to score more than 18 points against Oscar Shibwe and the Kentucky Wildcats? Go to the Upside app and drop your bet. It's easy money. Bet Timmy and one to four other players. They can be Gonzaga players or not. doesn't matter. And you can win cold, hard cash. Sign up with the promo code locked on one word and underdog will double your first deposit of up to $100. So deposit hundred dollars, get hundred dollars free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the underdog fantasy app in the app store or Google play store. 
That's underdog fantasy promo code locked on one word and get in on the pick them action today. All right, segment two. And I want to thank all of you sincerely for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, second segment, we are talking about what Gonzaga needs to do to pull out a victory here on Sunday. I know after Gonzaga's loss to Texas, it can feel very daunting to have another big game on the calendar, another team that has the ability to beat Gonzaga and potentially beat them badly. I don't expect Gonzaga to get ran out of the gym the way that they did against Texas, in part because they are not playing a true road game, in part because I just don't think Mark Few is going to let them do that. Uh, But obviously this team has some stuff that they need to work on, and there are some ways that Kentucky could potentially exploit some of those weaknesses. However, Gonzaga has some things they can do to potentially win this one as well, and I want to talk about those here in the second segment. First up, the biggest question I have, how is Gonzaga going to defend Severe Wheeler? He came off the bench in Gonzaga's game, or excuse me, against, in Kentucky's game against Michigan State. I don't expect that to continue. This was more of a health thing for him. One of their key returning players, uh, a really gifted passer. He sees the floor better than just about anybody in college basketball right now. Uh, he's also a gifted scorer, can get to the rim with ease. This is going to be a tough matchup because there are some the concerns we have about Nolan Hickman at point guard are going to be prevalent in this game as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but. Part of the issue is they need somebody to guard Severe Wheeler. And, and Hickman's probably not that guy. The guy who's best at guarding Severe Wheeler on this roster unquestionably is going to be Hunter Salas. And there's a legitimate argument to play him significantly more in this game because of what he's able to do defensively. Gonzaga doesn't have rim protection. It's been quite apparent through the first three, first couple of games this season, and it was kind of something known coming into the season that they don't have somebody like Chet Holmgren to erase any mistakes the guards make out on the perimeter. Severe Wheeler is the kind of guard who can get past Gonzaga's defense and get to the rim pretty easily. If Drew Timmy or Efton Reed or Anton Watson are down there, he's probably going to score. He might draw some contact, which is bad news for, for Gonzaga, especially if Drew Timmy's getting in foul trouble. So... Hunter Salas playing more minutes, playing defense out on the perimeter, keeping Severe Wheeler in front of him. To me, that's a huge key for what Gonzaga needs to do to win this game. Next up is, of course, the battle down low. We've already touched on it a handful of times, but it is one of, if not the most exciting battle between two returning players in college basketball in a very long time, quite frankly. Oscar Shibway drew Timmy as a first-time uh, two-time national or two-time All-American and National Player of the Year, both returning to school, both playing each other in the game. It's the first time that's happened in 50 years. Last time, Bill Walton was one of the players involved in the early 1970s uh, at UCLA, of course. So this is a, a dynamic individual player matchup. Of course, basketball is a team sport, but let's be honest, how Drew Timmy and Oscar Shibwe play in this game has a huge impact on who wins this game. It's not a guarantee that whoever plays better is the player whose team wins, but I, mean, I would bet money on it for sure. If Shibwe outscores Drew by five and out-rebounds him by three or four, maybe Gonzaga still wins, but like that's going to be tough. Uh, these two guys are, are so instrumental to each of their team's respective successes. Uh, again, Shibwe's starting to show a little bit more insight, impact on the defensive end of the floor. Drew is, has never been a great defensive player, but is also treated like he's significantly worse than he actually is. Shibwe is still going to get his buckets. He's still going to get his points on Drew, no doubt. I think Drew is still going to get his points on Shibwe as well, but kind of how, how the offenses are able to get the ball to their respective big men is going to be a, a strategy there too. Gonzaga has struggled straight up to pass the ball to Drew Timmy. That was the big issue in the Texas game. Only Anton Watson seemingly could even make that entry pass for the Zags. If they can find better, more creative ways to get him the ball in positions to succeed, that could be a huge turning point for the Zags to take this game home. Next up, more on the Salas-Hickman conversation. I think Salas needs to play more Nolan Hickman, Nolan Hickman in this game, and I think it might need to be significantly more. Hickman is still growing. He's still developing. And I think that in time, he will be the point guard that Gonzaga needs him to be. He may not ever be as good as Andrew Nembhard. That's hard. <laughs> Andrew Nembhard's really, really good, was a really good college player, is now a very good NBA player as well. Uh, but Hickman, the, the, the growth from Hickman between 
Wednesday against the Longhorns and Sunday against the Wildcats is probably not going to be enough for there to be dramatic changes. Unless Gonzaga makes just changes their playbook or just goes into the game with a completely different strategy, which is possible. I think that Nolan Hickman is going to struggle. I think Cason Wallace is going to be right up in his grill and he's a big physical, intense defensive guard. I think, and I think he's going to struggle defensively to try to stop severe Wheeler to stop Wallace. If that's who he ends up guarding. And so I see a situation where Hunter Salas, who is not as good of a point guard and, and Nolan Hickman in the sense that he is not running the offense. When, when, when Salas is playing point guard, they're, com- they're coming down the floor. He's basically, as soon as he crosses half court, he's doing a dribble handoff to Julian Strother or Rasir Bolt, and they're getting into a kind of motion offense. And from that point, Salas kind of retreats back to being more of a um, kind of hidden player offensively who's maybe making backdoor cuts, doing stuff like that, uh, crashing the offensive glass, but not necessarily an integral part of the ball screen actions or anything like that. So if Gonzaga does do a situation where Salas plays 30 minutes and is kind of the primary point guard, I think we'll see less of their offensive actions, which may just mean more situations where they're just figuring out how to get the ball to Drew Timmy. But defensively, it allows Gonzaga to be better at keeping Kentucky's guards in front of them, and that's going to be one of the biggest keys to them being able to win this game. Next up, the Zags need more from their transfers. I mean, uh, significantly more, quite frankly, at least in the case of Malachi Smith. Uh, He's been pretty quiet since the North Florida game. Really nice performance against North Florida. 15.6 assists coming off the bench. Played a team-high 30 minutes in that one. Didn't see a ton from him against Michigan State. Again, a lot of players, particularly guys who, who... our most productive as outside shooters were a bit kind of quiet in that game. He was good defensively in that one. He didn't have like a bad game necessarily. He was just a little quiet. I think the same with Texas and he was just quiet in that game. Didn't do a whole lot. Uh, His, his drill drives to the basket were not very productive. Like he he's, he hasn't been a big time contributor for Gonzaga yet. We're very early in the season. One of the games is a really kind of complicated one to evaluate. So I'm not, Hopeless about Malachi Smith, far from it. In fact, I think he's still a really critical part to this team's success. But it'd be a really nice time to see him pop off in a big way against Kentucky, prove that he can play with the big boys, prove that he's not only going to be productive against lower level opponents, prove that he has a really valuable spot in this rotation. Coming off the bench, hitting a couple threes, getting a few steals, you know, getting out in transition, that kind of stuff is going to be really, really critical for the Zags. And it's something that we know Malachi Smith can do. We just need to see it on that big stage. This would be a great game for that breakout. I don't think Efton Reed's going to have a huge role in this one, but he has been a guy who soaks up minutes when Drew Timmy is on the bench. Uh, And unfortunately, he continues to hamper his ability to play more minutes because he's getting in foul trouble. You can tell he's still learning Gonzaga's offense. He's still learning their defensive schemes. It's going to be a process for him, and that's fine. He's coming from LSU where they did things way differently on both ends of the floor. You can see the talent there for Efton Reed in moments. You can see the hook shot looks nice defensively when he's using his body correctly. He's very, very good at that. He's a really big, strong dude. He's just He's just not quite there yet. I don't think that Gonzaga needs him desperately in this game, but there are probably going to be moments where he's out there guarding Oscar Shibway, and it'd be nice if those weren't auto buckets. And I think that they they can be. I think Efton Reed is good enough on that end of the floor uh, to avoid that. But can he do that without picking up quick fouls and forcing Drew Timmy to come back in the game a little earlier than he wanted to? We'll see. And then finally, of course, the final takeaway, the, the most obvious one, uh, take, take care of the basketball. Take better care of the basketball. It's impossible to take worse care of the basketball than they did against Texas. 20 turnovers is obscene. You will almost never win a basketball game turning the ball over 20 times. Gonzaga shot it well against Texas from a percentage-wise. It wasn't that they were missing a bunch of shots. That's typically how you lose basketball games, not for the Zags. They shot the ball well. They just did not play particularly good defense and also turned the ball over a bunch. And that's just going to need to – they need to tighten that up. There's no excuses. Yes, the the home crowd energy at Texas probably played a role that will not play a role against Kentucky. Just need to take better passes, less sloppy passes, less fear of the physicality from the opposing team, less or more willingness to find ways to make that entry pass, to make sure you're getting it to Drew in a position where he can score. No dribbling the ball off your foot, no making passes over guys' heads, just that silly stuff that was a a way too common part of Gonzaga's game against Texas cannot happen here. Cannot happen here. They will lose badly again. If they do, if they have the same kind of turnover issues, I don't expect that to continue. I think Gonzaga will tighten up the turnovers. Uh, For me, this game is going to come down a lot to how the low post players score and how Gonzaga defends Kentucky's guards. I think that's a really big part of the game. 
I don't think the turnovers, and maybe I'm just too optimistic. Uh, I've been known to be that in the past, uh, but maybe the perhaps the guards will be able to tighten tighten things up a little bit, uh, run some different actions that prevent them from from putting themselves in positions where they might turn the ball over more. But it's going to be something to watch closely in this game. All right, final segment. We are switching away from talking Gonzaga, Kentucky, and we are going to talk about a couple Zags in the NBA who have had really nice starts to their seasons. Wanted to highlight them uh, to close out the week. Before we get there, though, I want to talk to you about Nugenics. Do you feel like you just can't get in shape? It's not your fault. As men age, our body naturally loses free testosterone. It happens to every man and can make it more difficult to stay in shape and be energetic and active. Wouldn't it be nice to get that winner's edge again and that old swagger back in your step? Do you want more energy to counter the negative physical effects of aging? Nugenics Total T Testosterone Booster with Testofen will help you turn back the clock, re-energize your workouts, get you better results at the gym, and help you look and feel like the man you really want to be. While every product professes quality, many other products use generic ingredients that are often far less than clinical grade. With Nugenics Total T, you can get the same clinical potency levels used in the trials. And Nugenics... Formulation is backed by 10 years of science and research. Nugenics Total T can help re-energize your life and help you get back the powerful, confident, good-looking warrior you used to be. Now get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total T when you text COLLEGE to 231231. Text now and get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo, their most powerful fat incinerator ever, with key ingredients to help you get back into shape fast, absolutely free. That's text COLLEGE to 231231. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags. We're talking about a trio of young Zags in the NBA and the starts to their NBA seasons that they have had. We're going to talk more about Zags in the NBA in future episodes, like to kind of sprinkle it in when we get an opportunity to do so. Uh, But for now, there's three guards in particular that I really want to focus on. We're going to start with Orlando Magic guard Jalen Suggs. Suggs has had a really nice start to the season. He missed a few games early in the year with an injury. Uh, It's always kind of bated breath with Jalen Suggs because he's just been so unfortunately injury prone early in his career. Only played 48 games as a rookie with Orlando. He has now played 10 games uh, with the Magic this season. Nine of them he started. He's played about 29 minutes per game. It's clear when he is healthy that this is he's a big part of what Orlando is trying to do with uh, with their squad right now. He's averaging 13 points, just over five boards, three and a half assists, and just under two steals per game. Again, Jalen Suggs, very productive player. The offense has started to tick up a little bit. Uh, The defense is still excellent, outstanding from him, does a little bit of everything. He's shooting just under, or excuse me, just over 53% on two pointers and exactly 30% from deep. 30% from deep is not great, but he shot 21% as a freshman, so or excuse me, as a rookie. So it is nice to see a 9% bump in the outside shooting. We've seen a few games where he has just been electric and just absolutely knocking down outside shots. I think he's always going to be a little bit of a streaky shooter. Perhaps he can kind of tighten that up and get more in the 34, 35% range from three would be a huge benefit for him and his production. He's had a couple really nice games recently. 26 points and nine assists against Golden State. Going at Steph Curry, taking it to one of the best dynasties in in NBA basketball history. 26 and nine for him in that one. And then he had 23 points, six boards, and six assists in his most recent game as of this recording against the Minnesota Timberwolves. So a really nice start to the season for Jalen Suggs. Hopefully he can maintain his health. Paolo Bancaro can come back to full health and Orlando can at least be a really fun team to watch for the rest of the season. Next up is Jalen Suggs' former running mate during that 2021 team. That is Andrew Nembhard, rookie point guard for the Indiana Pacers and now starting point guard for the Indiana Indiana Pacers. Nembhard has played 12 games this season. He has made four starts all in his most recent games taking over in part because of an injury suffered by Chris Duarte, former Oregon player. Uh, He's played 20 minutes per game for the Pacers. He's averaging seven points, three assists, two and a half rebounds, and one steal per game. Nembhard has been very efficient as a shooter. He's shooting 51.5% on two-pointers, so he's been good at getting to the rim, good at that mid-range shot that we all know and love from Andrew Nembhard, but also he's shooting 40.5% from deep, 41% from deep. That is incredible. The glow up 
for Andrew Nembhard as an outside shooter where he was not very good at Florida. He was okay his first year at Gonzaga. He was much better his final year at Gonzaga, and now he's even better in the NBA where the where the court is bigger, that's farther away from the hoop, and he's shooting better from deep. Yes, it's 12 games. It's obviously a small sample size, but still so incredible to see Andrew Nembhard becoming the best version of the basketball player that he can be. Uh, and the best version of the player that Andrew Nembhard can be is a guy who starts in the NBA. Clearly, he is an NBA starter for a team that is maybe not expected to contend all that much this year, but has some nice pieces. Like this is a this is a, an okay, solid basketball club that I think is going to get better if they make some, some shrewd moves in future years. Ben Matherin looks like a freaking stud. Duarte, when he's healthy, is very good. Tyrese Halliburton is a good player as well. And I, I think the Pacers have a chance to do something in the next couple of years. And Nemard's going to clearly be a part of it. He's been really fantastic. He had 15 points and five assists in his first start, which was against the Pelicans, his most recent game, 13 points and three steals. That was against Charlotte. Good to see him playing the best basketball of his entire career at the right time for Nemard in his first season with Indiana. Finally, closing out the show, another player on that 2021 team. Gosh, that team was good, you guys. Did you know that? Uh, we're talking Corey Kispert here of the Washington Wizards. Uh, Kispert only played seven games this year. He missed the start of the season with an ankle injury that he suffered uh, very early in the preseason for Washington. Uh, in those seven games, he has made five starts. He's only played about 22 and a half minutes per game as they ease him back into game action. Washington also has uh, a lot of players at similar positions, so they tend to run a lot of guys out there for 25 minutes a game as opposed to getting a little bit more action. I think this is fine for Corey, especially now as he's getting his legs back underneath him. He's averaged eight points, two boards, two assists, but I really wanted to highlight how great he has been as a shooter. Again, seven games, very small sample size, but Corey is shooting just under 71% on two pointers. <laughs> he is not missing around the rim in the mid range, long twos, any of that. He is knocking that stuff down. He's also shooting 40% from three, which, you know what, that's going to get it done too. 40% from deep, 70.6% on two pointers through his first couple of games of the season, proving himself to be more than just a spot up shooter. That was kind of the, the fear, the knock a little bit on Corey was can he be anything more than just like a six foot eight? Spot up shooter, effectively, and yes, he can. He's he's got good floor vision. He can make good passes defensively. He's still working on that, but he's he's fine. He's not a complete black hole on that end of the floor. His backdoor cutting is good. His ability to get to the rim, f finish through contact, get to the free throw line, all that stuff is there. Is present. He's showing it off now. Washington, very happy to have this kind of player, a more dynamic offensive and defensive player than perhaps they even thought they were getting with the 15th pick a couple of years ago. Also, Corey had a four game stretch where he went eight for 10 from deep. That's going to get it done. That's going to get it done right there as you're just absolute money from beyond the arc. It, it opens everything else up. If he's shooting like that, defenders have to come out on him. He can put the ball on the deck, look for open guys that way, or try to get all the way to the rim. Uh, it just creates a much more uh, fluid situation for Washington's offense and, and allows Corey to be more involved as he gets healthier and his minutes tick up. I'm sure some of those percentages will probably dip a little bit, but he looks like he's on pace to potentially have, uh, a, if not a full on breakout season for Washington, at least a season that makes you realize, okay, this is a guy who, who has the potential to be really, really impactful outside of just his outside shooting. All right, that is going to do it for me today and for this week. Enjoy the game on Sunday. Zags fans will, of course, have recaps after that game. Also, do not forget to check out the new Locked On College Basketball podcast hosted by myself and co-host Isaac Shade of Locked On Tar Heels. Five days a week talking all things college basketball. Plenty of other Gonzaga talk in there as well. That is available on YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet and also wherever you get podcasts. All right, thank you all for listening. And go Zags.